welcome to episode four of Dielectric Videos. Now on today's episode, I thought I would show you uh, one of my interesting uh, contraptions that I've assembled. This is my high precision digital clock. Rather, it is high precision, but not particularly high accuracy. I'll get into that in a second, but it is pretty darn cool looking, I think. It's uh, made up of seven segment displays, pretty big ones at that, uh, with the colons within the, uh, the colons denoting hours, minutes, and seconds made out of red LEDs. And interestingly, there are a bunch of blinky lights down here, which I will show you uh, the function of later on. So just to give a general description of uh, the clock and kind of what it looks like if, you, if I turn it around a bit, you can see the entire uh, clock has been soldered together on a Vero board. This took a very long time and a lot of soldering to get all this stuff together, not to mention testing and retesting and figuring out what was wrong with it for about the nth time. But uh, ultimately, it ended up being a pretty good product. Uh, I have the Vero board drilled out and mounted using uh, just quarter inch bolts between two pieces of plexiglass. And uh, then I have the power board on the back. This is a linear regulator pair. It's actually two five volt linear regulators in series to give 10 volts and your usual bridge rectifier and filter caps. Now I have this then wired to a uh, just doorbell transformer. It's just a little uh, 12 volt nominal, uh, probably five volt amper transformer, little tiny thing and a nice uh, silvery plastic cord going off to the power source. Now one thing you might, uh, if you look very closely, you might notice is that there are not two wires coming from the power board, but three wires coming from the power board to the clock. And you might wonder, well, why is that? Well, this, believe it or not, is a synchronous clock. You might remember uh, from a very long time ago, clocks used to, uh, lose time or gain time if they were uh, battery operated and plugged into the wall uh, where they had like a backup nine volt. And that was because they really only kept accurate time using the mains frequency. That was their primary counter. And they wouldn't be very accurate if the power was out because well, whatever little timer circuit connected to the battery to get, keep the time wasn't always that good. Now this doesn't have a battery, this is fully reliant on uh, the power staying on to operate it, but it is pretty darn reliable. Uh, originally I was having some reliability issues with the synchronous power as far as keeping it stable because every time say the printer would kick on, the fuser within my laser printer would cause it to gain time because you get fluctuations in the AC mains. Now I uh, got, went about fixing that problem with this capacitor across the main transformer. This just smooths out the AC waveform to make sure it really is as close to a sine wave as possible, even if there's voltage spikes and voltage drops accordingly. Now you might notice on the back I have a few switches. Uh, these are all, uh, these two are the clock advanced switches. I can multiply it by 60 or by 3600 to advance the clock uh, to whatever time it is approximately. And then there's a hack button, which of course lets me halt the clock to allow the real time to catch up with the clock time. It allows you to set it to a high degree of accuracy. Now, as I mentioned, even though it has a high degree of precision, it counts to the tenth of seconds, it's not all that accurate because after a while, the power company's AC main signal does tend to cumulatively drift one way or the other. And after, say, a week, you're usually gonna have lost like 10 to 15 seconds. I actually had one week where the previous week's loss was actually counted up for in the next week's gain. It was almost perfect by the time I got back. But most of the time, you're gonna see a certain amount of drift. Certainly not to be taken as 10th of a second accuracy all the time. But for short-term timing, it's great. It gives you a very uh, high precision short-term uh, timing constant or timing uh, solution. And at the same time, it's really cool looking. So that being said, uh, I will get, show you a few interesting characteristics that make this different from other synchronous clocks. It's built from the uh, 40 or the 4026 counter chips. And what a 4026 is, is a decade counter, meaning it counts clock pulses from zero to 10 or zero to nine and resets each time. 
but it also has an included seven segment decoder that sends whatever pattern is supposed to be displayed on the seven segment display directly out from its pins. So you don't need external decoders for each seven segment display. Now, the first chip's not connected to a display and it is essentially counting from zero up to five and then resetting at the every time it reaches five. And what that's doing is it's dividing the 60 hertz AC mains, since in the United States, the AC mains happens to be 60 hertz into 10th second units, which is what's then counted by this next chip and displayed on this screen. That chip carries out to the next one by its full carry out factor of 10, and this one counts up to 10 itself. Now, how you might ask, did I get a decade counter to divide by five, or rather to divide by six instead of 10? Well, normally you would basically use an AND gate and you could connect the outputs to the screen uh, that are unique to a six to that AND gate, which is exactly what I've done. I'll explain in the second half of the video when I actually draw out the schematics for this, uh, or at least the limited form of the schematics. But I thought, well, an AND gate on a little integrated circuit is pretty boring. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. So I thought, well, I know you can make an AND gate out of a few diodes and a pull-up resistor, but can you use light emitting diodes? Now light emitting diodes have a high forward voltage drop. And as a result, I wasn't sure if it was going to count accurately or if it's going to have problems because the logic high and logic low would have that forward diode drop associated with it. But these TTL based drivers, or actually these might be CMOS now that I think about it, but these driver chips don't really have that close of a tolerance requirement for the high signal and digital low signal. They can take a pretty big range on either side. And that means the LEDs actually work perfectly well as diodes and they conduct in one direction when current's flowing and they turn off and don't conduct in the other direction when current tries to flow in the other direction. So I have the first one dividing by six to give you 10 seconds. The second one doesn't div or just divides by 10, it's the default. The third one, of course, uh, which is uh, also dividing by 10 to give you this, is the usual divide by 10. The next one where you have these LEDs, as you saw it just changed, that's turning this into fi uh, dividing this by six because there's only 60 seconds in a minute. This one does 10 because there's 10 minutes in a 10 minute period. This one again does six because there's 60 minutes in an hour. And then you get to the hours. This is where it gets complicated. So in a 12 hour clock, you want it to count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, 11, 12, 1. And the hard thing about that is one o'clock is not where the decade counter would normally start over. Normally the decade counter would start over at zero o'clock, but zero o'clock is 12 o'clock in a 12 hour time system. So I'll just demonstrate how this, uh, this clock works and I'll try to explain kind of how I set it up. More details will follow later in the video. So I'm gonna press the time 60 advanced switch, which you can see on the back here. This is the X60, well, I'll get it in the camera. X60 display switch and X3600 display switch. So I'm gonna hit the X60 so you can see the clock and notice that it's counting one minute every second. Essentially what I've done is I've forwarded the 60 Hertz AC mains directly to the seconds. The seconds are now counting 60 seconds every sec or 60 of these every second and thus one minute per second. So I'll stop that so it's back to normal and I'll try times 3600. Well now you can see the seconds are behaving normally but the minutes are now uh, counting by degrees of uh, 60 times a second at 60 hertz. That's of course giving you one hour every 60, uh, every one second, or every 60 AC mains cycles. So if we watch this thing after it starts over, it's 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and now it's AM when it hit AM. And you notice that these three lights came on. Well, I'll explain in the next video why those three lights came on and exactly what is going on with these extra two chips that if you can look closely are not the same chip as the 4026s. So I'll get back to you on that part of the video. 
and hopefully I will be able to explain exactly how I'm doing this magic with the 12. One last thing, of course, I'll show you how the hack button works. If I hold this down, it halts everything except the first counter. Essentially, it's just shunting the output carryouts from this counter to ground and holding the rest still, therefore, which of course would allow you to set the clock ahead of time by slightly. So say right now it's uh, 4.15. Well, I can set this ahead by a bit until it gets to just past 4.15. Wait for it, and boom. And, oops, I pressed the wrong button. Let's say it's 4, uh, we'll say it's 4.20 or 4.35 or something. We'll let it catch up for a bit. And 32, 33, 34, and 35. Now, let's say it's about 35.05 right now. I will wait until it catches up. I'll put it a little bit ahead, halt it at 10. Well, then I wait for my watch to catch up to that time. And when it finally does hit 10, I release the hack button and it's perfectly set. Of course, this is not the real time. It's not 4.35 in the morning. I'm not sure why I would record videos at 4.35 in the morning. But this is the basic function of the clock and I'll get back to you on its uh, actual design on paper. So once again, if uh, wiring diagrams and explanations on paper are not quite as interesting to you as the clock itself, I will say goodbye and have a good day. Now I'm on to the next part. All right, so now I'm gonna show you exactly how I actually built and operated this clock by in kind of a more uh, paper and pen oriented route. Now it occurred to me in the previous video about transformer theory that I did not do a very good job of making my drawings visible to the viewer. I was using a small eight and a half by 11 paper with a 0.7 millimeter pencil. So I've broken out the big paper and the marker. Hopefully this will make it somewhat easier for you, the viewer, to see what I'm talking about. So I've already shown you uh, kind of how the cascading chips essentially work, but to give a little bit more of an explanation, each of these chips has a pin called carry out or C out. And what that essentially does is it goes on to the next chip and tells it that this chip has just finished counting to 10 or has just been reset, and now it's time for this chip to increment by one, plus one. Now the carryout pulls high for the first four iterations of this chip, and then turns off when it gets to the fifth one. That's presumably to make sure it stays on long enough for the next chip to register. For example, if this one was moving very, very fast, because I believe these chips can actually operate into the megahertz range, and of course other TTL or CMOS technology might not be that fast. So anyway, the carryout pulls high and tells the next chip to uh, advance or increment itself by one. And what essentially tells it to do this is either it gets to 10 and then resets to zero, or it gets a reset pin. There is an RST reset, and if that gets pulled high, the chip automatically returns to zero regardless of the state. Now, the way that I've implemented this, I'm actually using a three diode AND gate. Now, traditionally, an AND gate would either be done with a, an integrated circuit or with uh, multiple diodes and a pull-up resistor, and I'll show you basically how that works. So if you essentially have a pull-up resistor to pull up uh, a, your circuit high, and then you have this pull-up resistor wired to a set of diodes such that, uh, let's say this is your chip, uh, and you have three outputs. Well, what you essentially are trying to detect is when all three outputs are high. And in order to do this, you want to make it so that no current will flow from the pull-up resistor into the chip when they're all pulled or set high. So to do this, you set up a diode. And if you set up your diode, I believe like this, uh, its current is always going to flow down through the diode from here like this and into the chip so long as the chip or each of these outputs is low. So it doesn't matter that they're all low or that one of them is low. If any of these inputs is a low, current through the pull-up resistor will flow down into it and this will have approximately zero volts. Now, the only case in which this will go up is when they are all high. So if every single output is high, these are all positively biased on this side. No current is flowing 
and suddenly this entire circuit is pulled up by the pull-up resistor and becomes full voltage, which in my case would be about 10 volts, which is a logic one. This is why the AND gate works. Traditionally, you would use some kind of logic diode, shot key diode, or any other kind of solid state diode to perform this type of AND gate operation. However, I got to thinking, well, what if I made it a little more interesting by using light emitting diodes for these, uh, these diodes? Now, of course, the purpose of the diode is to make sure that it is truly an AND gate and that one output does not affect the others. The only way in which this can actually go high is if current is flowing through no diodes. If one of these was pulled low, you want to make sure that the others don't accidentally get dragged down with it if you didn't have diodes. So really all the diodes are serving to do is block the flow of current in the reverse direction. And for that reason, you can really use any kind of diode, even an LED, which does have a fairly high forward voltage drop. Because in the implementation of the AND gate, the forward voltage drop is not so much of an issue. The only thing that needs to happen is it needs to be about zero volts. Most LEDs have a forward voltage drop between one and three volts. So if it's about like two volts most of the time, the chips further down the line will still count it as a logic low. And thus the carry out, or rather the reset, which is triggered by this pulling high and thus tells the chip, you got to five, time to reset, ends up working. Now, how did I officially get into the idea of using an AND gate and what are these connected to? Well, I'll get into that as well. So if I want this chip or any of these chips that have the LEDs to divide by six, I want them to count to five. And as soon as they then get to six, I want them to reset. And that's because the zero takes up an entire unit of time of say a tenth of a second, and then the one, and then the two, and then the three, and then the four, and finally after the five, you are at six uh, iterations of the chip. So to uh, describe essentially how that works, I'll show you the seven segment display. And I'll write out basically the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, and the six, like this. Now these numbers here each have a unique set of on position uh, LEDs and off position LEDs. And essentially what you're trying to do is figure out, is there a unique combination that are only on in the six and nothing earlier than the six? Well, it just so happens that this one, this one, and this one are those unique positions. These are positions F, G, and E. And essentially what you're looking for is when do these turn on all at once? Thus, when does the AND gate as we know from digital logic, an AND gate essentially looks for when everything is a one and then only outputs a one when everything is a one. So you want your AND gate connected to these three segments. And you'll notice if you uh, pretend that there is nothing here because in the one, those are the ones that light up or that uh, light up on this side, you'll notice that up until the six, nothing shows these three pins on at the same time. They're all off in the case of the one, uh, in the two, this one's on and this one's on, but that one is off. In the three, this one's on, but those two are off. In the four, uh, this one is on and this one is on, but this one is not. Um, I'll just be consistent and put that there by the two as well. In the five, this one is on and this one is on, but that one is not on. But in the six, these three are on and it doesn't occur anywhere else before the six. So what happens is you count uh, zero. Oh, I should have also mentioned zero because it's an easy one to forget. But once again, this one's on, this one's on, that one is not on. So when you're counting to six, it goes zero, then one. And I'll, I'll just give these little steps to show that a second has gone by or a, a unit of time has gone by. So one unit of time, two units of time, three units of time, four units of time, five units of time, and the sixth one, meaning that as soon as you get to that six, you want it to instantly go back to being a zero that gets you your six iterations. So you connect this uh, diode logic circuit and its output to the reset pin 
and when it sees the reset pin pulling high, the chip gets reset to zero and the carry out gets pulled high. So I started over here to give you a quick look at how the hours uh, counter works. Now I've got a blank piece of paper so I can really kind of go into detail as to how this works because this was a rather interesting uh, set of logic calculations to make. Now, to make the hours work, if you watch what happens on the screen here, I want it to count all the way up to 12 and then go back to one. So I'm gonna let it spin up really fast. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one. Now, if you pay, uh, paid close attention to that, you probably saw these three diodes turning on and off. Now, what those were essentially doing were performing the same type of diode logic that these diodes over here are performing, except they were switching this extra one on and off. That would be the tens place hours. So that was relatively easy. But what did I need to do to get the uh, ones place for the hours to count to 10, go to zero, and then go one, two, one? because that's really hard to do uh, when a decade counter normally wants to count to some either 10 or some cutoff value and then reset at zero. Well, what I did was I used these 4013 flip-flop chips. Now what a flip-flop does is it takes a clock pulse and it also takes in a, I guess you'd call it a status uh, update or a status pin and when it receives a clock pulse, it puts whatever logical input, whether it's a zero or a one on the status, and sends it to the output, which is called the Q pin. So if this was a status zero and the clock pulse uh, fired the chip, the Q would also become a zero. And regardless of the previous state of Q, if it was a one, it would become a one regardless of its previous state. So that's how a flip-flop works. Now the implementation I used here was I set up essentially a capacitor to generate a short little pulse of input only when it reached 10 o'clock. And essentially what that was doing was it injects a one into the flip-flop chain. Now I say the flip-flop chain because to do this, I actually used three different flip-flops. So if this is the first flip-flop, what I did was I sent the output uh, over to another flip-flop which I then sent to a third flip-flop. Now, essentially, all the clock pulses for these were wired directly together, so all of these flip-flops fire at the same time. The effect of this is, when the first one receives a one at the input, it carries it on to the next after an hour has passed, and it carries it on to the next while well, a second hour has passed. Now, the last flip-flop wasn't connected to anything on its Q output, and as a result of that, it doesn't actually uh, have any real effect on the circuit, meaning that it can start over from the beginning. Now that may make a lot of sense uh, as to how I can make uh, that work with a 12, but you might ask, well, how did I get this interesting little pulse? Well, going back to what I said in the previous part of the video, these decade counters uh, have a carryout which pulls high for the first four iterations and then on the fifth iteration pulls low. So I took advantage of that in that when the 12 counts 10, 11, 12, it has just pulled high from reset and it doesn't pull low again until after it's uh, actually achieved that fifth position. And now that doesn't actually occur until after it has gotten all the way past the two and into the next cycle. The reason for that being that when you reset it from 10 o'clock, or from uh, rather 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock and it resets, the output pulls high, it gets another reset when it gets to the 12 o'clock, but the output stays high until it reaches the 5, uh, 5 o'clock the next day. What this means is the signal essentially pulls high only when the reset is at the 10. It will not pull high when it goes from 12 to 0. Now this is really uh, really not, not all that useful initially because if you're trying to just put this signal into the flip-flop, the flip-flop's just gonna pump a bunch of ones through and it's not really gonna be useful. It'll say, it'll think it's 10, 11, and 12 at the same time. So the solution around that is a capacitor. Now if you connect a capacitor within a circuit, 
uh, and you pull one side high and the other and the capacitor by default is low well it's going to produce a high pulse on this other side but if you have a pull down resistor here to ground this side after being pulled high will gradually discharge back down to zero through this resistor and what you essentially get from this pull up uh, capacitor is you get this little pulse like that and that little pulse is just enough for the clock pulse input on this uh, on this decade or this uh, flip flop chip to see that as a logical one on the input. So when it transitions from nine to ten, it gets the pulse, feeds the one into the flip flop chain, and then does the eleven or the ten, eleven, twelve back to one. That's essentially how I'm avoiding having it reiterate that. 10, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, every time it resets. Now I'm gonna uh, tear off a new sheet of paper here and go into one last thing about the 12 that some of the more digital logic oriented and experienced people might have caught on to, and that is, well, if I'm counting to 12, how do I get it to reset to a one instead of a zero? Because if I'm just resetting the decade counter after the flip-flop chain has gotten done, it should go to a zero, right? Well, the way I actually implemented this, I thought was rather interesting. I have my three flip-flops in a row, but the last flip-flop does many more tasks than the previous two. The first thing the last flip-flop does is it goes and fires a pin on the 4026, controlling the hours. Remember, the 4026 is the decade counter, and this pin is called the blank or the uh, disable uh, pin. Now, what this does is it turns off the 4026's outputs to the seven segment display. It turns these completely off. However, it does not stop counting. Now, if it doesn't stop counting, uh, that means it continues on from where it started. The next thing that happens when you reach the 12 uh, it, the 12th position, in the actual transition from 11 to 12, uh, this transition signal goes and hits the reset. Now, what happens here is the chip goes from thinking that it should be at 1 going to 2 when it's going from 11 to 12, and it goes instead from 1 to 0 inside its own decade counter. Now, remember, if this is just uh, if the blank pin is enabled, the zero that's normally displayed on this 4026 is not going to the seven or to the seven segment display right now. The seven segment display isn't really showing anything. But I actually did a third thing with this flip flop, and I went and drove a Darlington pair of transistors, which is essentially a high gain set of transistors, and you can actually see it right here. And what it does is it takes the small uh, high signal from the flip-flop and amplifies it to a relatively strong signal. That relatively strong signal is fed through a diode array, so a diode array, which you can see right here, and that makes sure that it's not going to backfeed into the chip. From the diode array, it's pumped directly into this seven segment display in the exact pattern of a tube. So even though the uh, 4026 only thinks it's uh, zero o'clock, the display is showing a two. And of course, because of the AND gate, which is coupled to the flip-flops, the tens place one is also still active. So it finally gets from its uh, 11 through to its, I'll say the fake 12, because the chip actually thinks it's a zero. And finally, the flip-flops run out, so there's nothing left here and the zero at the same time transitions to a one. So when the zero transitions to a one, it's now one o'clock. And really the only thing I had to do to get the AM PM to work is use that fourth flip-flop because remember there's actually two flip-flops within each 4013 chip. And that last flip-flop I basically just have controlling the last pin on the AP uh, input on the AM PM, that basically just random, or that just flips from AM to PM every time a 12 hour period has been terminated. So hopefully now it makes a bit more sense uh, why I needed all these extra chips and how the clock distinguishes between going from 12 o'clock to one o'clock and between going from 
9 o'clock to 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. Because even though the chip has to reset in both instances, it is subtly different, and as a result, I have to add all this extra circuitry. So hopefully you've uh, gotten a pretty good look at how this clock works. Um, the basic principle of its operation is, once again, the synchronous inputs. I can control the speed at which the clock runs by using these advanced pins, which really are just forwarding the 60 hertz to the other parts of the clock, the minutes and the hours respectively. I can stop the clock with the hack button, and of course it does tell the time to whatever accuracy the power company uh, provides it. I use the interesting uh, diode logic using LEDs for my AND gates, and with all of this coupled into one, it makes a pretty darn cool looking clock. So thank you for watching my video, uh, I hope to uh, see you next time, and I hope that you uh, go out and consider working on a project similar to this on your own. Now this is a pretty advanced project for the beginner, but any electronics enthusiast who uh, learns enough about digital logic should be able to relatively easily put one of these together. So thank you for watching Dielectric videos, see you next time.